What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby reminisces with Nell Donnelly Reed, a pioneer in the business of women's wear. Her Nellie Don brand, based in Kansas City's Garment District, outfitted women from coast to coast. Here in Kansas City, we had one of the premier garment industries in the United States. And preeminent among those companies was Nellie Don, founded, built, and run by Nell Donnelly Reed. She was the preeminent American businesswoman right here in Kansas City. So please welcome Nell Quinlan Donnelly Reed. A be beautiful frock. Is it a Nellie Don? Oh, well, yes, it is, of course. But of course. I never wear any anything but. You were a millionaire before women could vote, the second self made woman millionaire after Madam C.J. Walker, who was, after all, in the same business, the women's presentation business as well. You were the largest dress manufacturer in the United States and probably the world. How did you do it? And why did you do it? Well, I simply found a niche that needed filling, and I filled it. Um, at the time, turn of the century, of course, uh, women had only two options where clothing in the home was concerned. You could either, when you're working in home, wear these shapeless, unattractive calico uh, Mother Hubbard dresses, we called them. They were 69 cents off the rack, and they just, they looked like a gunny sack hanging off your body. They were awful. You know, you could get a nice, dress made, uh, custom made, but that was well, there, expensive. There were 800 dressmakers in yes. Kansas City when you started uh, Nell, Nellie Don. How did you compete with these women who were custom making these, these, these pretty clothes? Well, I hired a lot of them. Okay. There you, go. <laughs> you, you didn't just make functional clothes, you made fashionable clothes. Well, they weren't work clothes. They were clothes that worked for women. They were form-fitting, but they weren't tight. They often had um, pleated skirts and, oh, short sleeves with lots of freedom of movement and always a pocket. You need a pocket when you're working at home. I knew the importance of uh, adding extra hemline and uh, waistline and things like adjustable shoulder straps and, and uh, belt loops and things like that because that way a woman could easily just go snip, snip, snip and suddenly she has a longer waist and she can do her own alterations and she doesn't have to to pay a seamstress to do that for her. So you were always thinking about the women. Mm -hmm. where, where did this come from? Uh, where, where, did, where did you come from? Take us back to Parsons, Kansas, is Parsons, that right? Parsons, Kansas, yes. Uh, I was raised in Parsons, Kansas. I was the fifth daughter, uh, the youngest daughter, in a family of 13 children. 13 children, yes, yes okay. Um, Your mother was very productive. Extremely. <laughs> you, both your mother and father yes, were immigrants uh, from Ireland? He came from County Cork, Ireland. Uh, emigrated here and uh, met my mother in Illinois and subsequently uh, moved to Parsons, Kansas, where he worked on the Katy Railroad. You got a different kind of education. Parsons, Kansas, you wouldn't think of this, but, uh, but, but maybe the Irish Catholic background. You were educated well, I was, actually I was educated by, by nuns. Yes. By nuns. Yes, and they were, uh, there was one oh, uh, from Ireland and one from France, and they had a marvelous education themselves. And, and of course, the, the really important part of your education was probably what you learned from your mother because, <laughs> l let's face it, sewing became, became the, the center of your, of your life. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us about how you, how you learned to sew, what you did with that. Well, my mother and my eldest sister, Mary, taught me to sew. And uh, I, it was a good thing to know because as the youngest daughter, I got nothing but hand-me-downs. So they all had to be remade, they all had to be altered and repaired. In a, in a, in a family of, of 13, immigrant family of 13, hardworking, you're taught to make your, your own way. And you did make your own way, and your own way brought you to Kansas City. At 16. You'd learn to be a stenographer. Yes, I did. And, and, that, and that led you to a boarding house in Kansas City where you encountered what later you called a modern business romance. Yes, where I encountered Paul Donnelly. 
Paul Donnelly. Yes, he was also a stenographer at the time, living in the boarding house, and we were married a year later when you I was were 17. 17 and yes. he was 23. Yes. But you had ambition. It wasn't enough for you to uh, just be a housewife. You did something really unusual at that point, which you had the support of Paul Donnelly for. You went to. I went to Lindenwood College in, in St. Charles. St. Louis. In St. St. Charles. Charles. Yes. Sorry, St. Charles Mo. Yes, yeah. I was the only married student there. It was unheard of at the time for a married student to go board at college, but I, I wanted a higher education. But then with a degree and, and, and obviously a, a lot of gumption and a lot of ambition, you went back and for a few years you were a housewife. Well, yes. But there must have been a moment of, of, of inspiration for you that led to the founding of, of this company and a, a moment of which you created this company. Tell, tell us about that. I, uh, I was a housewife when we first moved back to Kansas City for about seven years, and I did a lot of sewing in that time. And like I said, I absolutely refused to wear <laughs> those Mother Hubbard dresses. I just hated them. So I made my own, and they were pretty. They were very pretty dresses. And my friends saw them, and, and they said, oh, <laughs> you should try selling those. Finally, so who did, you, who did you try to sell them to? I, sold, I tried to sell them to everybody, but there was nobody interested until I got to George C. Peck's dry goods store. Two, two blocks from here, 12th, yeah, 12th, and, 12th and, Main. and Main. Yes, absolutely. And Mr. Peck, he wasn't very thrilled about the idea either. He said, nobody in the right mind would buy a $1 dress. And too expensive. <laughs> $1 dress, too yes. expensive. I convinced him, I sweet-talked him into it, and I said it was on my risk. On consignment, risks. yeah, you, 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 you sweet-talked him into it because you gave it to him on consignment, right? That's right. I said it's, it's my risk, my investment, and uh, he ordered 18 dozen of them to be delivered within two months. But and that's a lot when you're, sewing, lot when you're sewing at home, right? That's 216 so, dresses. So how did, how did you do that? Well, um, Paul... Uh, scraped together $1,270 to buy um, several used foot pump sewing machines and then uh, the fabrics, of course, and then uh, my niece, Kate McCormick, and myself, and uh, a neighbor lady, Mrs. Herbert, we all sat in my living room at 31st and Montgall and sewed for two months straight, nonstop, a lot of coffee. <laughs> I quickly learned that if I put each of us in charge of a certain a part of the construction of each dress, it would go a lot faster. And I continue to use those techniques. Well, sort of like Henry Ford, yeah, it sounds like. exactly. Amazing, right? And it's here a good thing, too, River because City. they sold out just like that the first morning. Wow. And so uh, other folks started to, uh, uh, to order from you, and, mm -hmm. and World War I happens. And Paul, who is a pretty good business guy, yes. he goes off to war. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he kind of, he kind of, he left you flat or did? No, no, no. Now before he left, he secured for me a line of credit that I would need for the business. And he found us some proper factory space in the Coca-Cola building. And he told me before he left, he said, pay your bills on time and don't plunge. He said, go just a step or two slower than you think you can and you'll be safe. Well, obviously you were safe because by the time Paul Donnelly came back from World War I, you had 18 employees. $250,000 in, uh, in sales and no debt. You've built the company, but he's the president and you're the secretary treasurer. Well, yes. <laughs> but but you're, you're the person who's doing this. You're the manufacturing yes, genius. You're the promotional genius. And uh, give us an example of that. How about that incredible invention of yours? The handy dandy apron. It's a very special design. I patented it so no one else can make it. Um, I used it during the Great Depression after the stock market fell, and it had great big pockets for utensils and pockets, and, always yeah, pockets, always pockets uh, oven mitts and things like that. And it was so pretty. It had lovely lines. You know, you looked lovely while you were cooking. The most important thing, though, is that it was constructed with one single seam. So you never had to you never, never had, had to lift the, the presser sewing foot. machine. Yeah. Yes, you could go from start to finish of the garment, never lift the presser foot, and we just. <laughs> made a million of them. That, that, that's amazing. So at the same time, in the, in the, in the 20s, you're traveling to Europe, and you're seeing traveling these French deal. designs, beautiful French silk designs, but American women in the, in the home or at work are not wearing French silk. No. But you had the idea to take the French silk. And, and I had it printed on cotton and rayon and produced in New England. It was a revolution at the time, and it allowed gorgeous, gorgeous prints in... Uh, fabrics that you could wash and easily drip dry, very little ironing necessary, and a lot cheaper than so. And so by 1931, <laughs> let's go to 1931, 
you were making a million five hundred thousand dresses, three million five hundred thousand dollars in sales, which is a big American company at that at that point. You've moved from the from the uh, the Coca-Cola building, the Western Auto building, into the Corrigan building, yes. taking taking four floors of that. You've created maybe uh, in one way the first modern boutique in in many department stores we around. We had Nelly Don shops in just about every department store that sold exclusively Nelly Don fashions. But not everything is quite as bright as it might seem, because no. your husband Paul Donnelly, he was a philandering dipsomaniac. He's well, uh, in all fairness, the man was a manic depressive as well, so there were chemical issues there. And you wanted a family, but, I did. but yes. he didn't. And he was adamantly opposed to it. He'd have these manic depressive episodes where he would he'd pull a gun out of the desk drawer in the office and threaten his life with it if I ever became pregnant. Wow, what would you do about that? Oh, I simply waited till he left the office and then I pulled the gun out and dropped it down the elevator shaft of the Coca-Cola building. Must have been 30 guns down at the bottom of that thing. <laughs> Start a gangland war. And you've, you've moved to, uh, of course, to a larger house on Oak Street that many, many Kansas Cityans w would know because today it's the Toy and Miniature <laughs> Toy Museum. And miniature uh, <laughs> you discover your next door neighbor who is one of Kansas City's uh, greatest figures. Yes. Senator James A. Reed. Yes. And Quite how did you get to know Senator Reed? Well, originally I got to know him because he, he litigated a lawsuit that I took against a St. Louis company. He was doing knockoffs of my handy dandy apron. Uh, when we were living, catty corny to one another, we both had big dogs. And so there was a, a dog run that, that was shared between the two properties. And we just sit out there you know, for hours, watch the dogs play, had lovely conversations. And the, is Senator Reed, uh, part of the, related to the Pendergast machine, very su supported by, by his good friend Tom Pendergast, he, he runs for president at, at one point. 1928. In 1928. And, and so in, after 1928, not becoming president, he decided to retire. Uh, it become uh, a lawyer uh, again uh, back in, in, uh, in Kansas City, and you became very, very close to him at this point, at the same time that Paul Donnelly, your husband, was going off the tracks. Yes, well, uh, there was one particular night, uh, I recall he threw an ashtray at me across the dinner table. I barely, I barely ducked in time. I think that was when I really knew it, it, our marriage was Headed for, <laughs> headed for the hills, but... Um. Well, I, I, I need to ask you now about a very sensitive subject, and time has passed and mores have changed a little bit, so perhaps we can be frank about this, but can you tell us now the true story about David Quinlan Donnelly Reed? Well, the truth is that I was pregnant uh, with Jim Reed's child. But to help Paul save face, um, and to protect the business, I went, I left town. I told everyone I was going to Europe to adopt a baby, but I went to Chicago and I gave birth to David on September 10th, 1931, and brought him home. It, it, was a, it was a different time period, you know. There was a, a certain story you told the world uh, for propriety's sake, and there was an entirely different story going on behind closed doors, and that was true of a great many people. Right. And that's just the way it was. That's what you did. And then only a few months later, December 16th, 1931, a story that made headlines across the United States, you and your chauffeur, George Blair, coming home to, to, to your home with, with Paul, and you find someone in the blocking your, your driveway. Yes, there was a car uh, blocking the gate to where we would ordinarily drive in, and there were men uh, outside with the hood up looking under the car as though they were having car trouble. So George hung his head out the window and, and hollered over there, what's wrong? And they said, could you give us a push? And they came over to the car, and then all of a sudden they pulled a gun out, and they forced George onto the floorboards of the, the front seat of the car, and they, they tied his hands and feet, and they said, don't holler. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm in the back fighting for all I'm worth. He, they tried to put a bag over my head at that point, and then there was a, a third one who jumped in and was driving and, and said, hit her in the head, hit, choke her. They're hitting you and They're choking hitting the, you, trying to put the, the hood, head, hood over mouth, you? I was bleeding, and... Um, when, when they found the car later, they, they, they changed cars and they parked the car behind the Plaza Theater, and in the car they found blood and ropes and, and, and paint A rope chips. with red paint chips on it. Where did they take you? 
well, I didn't know at the time, of course, that we just drove west for about an hour. It, it turns out it was somewhere in Bonner Springs. It was a farmhouse. And um, it was the four rooms, and they kept us tied to these two cots, filthy cots in the back room. No light. Um, no light. It was pitch black. And the first night, they made me write this ransom note. They dictated to me. And how much did they, they, want, did they ask for they the ransom? They asked for $75,000. They said if, if word got out at all in the media, that they would blind me and kill George. And they call your lawyer, James Taylor, mm -hmm. and he thinks it's a crank call. Until the next morning when Paul arrives with the ransom note and he realizes that I have indeed been kidnapped. So he contacts Jim Reed. Jim Reed, who's, who's, his who's down in Jefferson City. And we've already mentioned the fact that Senator Reed is very close to Tom Pendergast and, and the Pendergast machine. And there's, there's this other guy in town uh, who really, it's, it's not clear whether he runs Pendergast or Pendergast runs him, but he's certainly the mob boss of Kansas City. We're talking about Johnny Lazia. And Senator Reed, Jim Reed calls Johnny, Johnny Lazia. Lazia. And asked him, what do you know about this? And Lazia says... He said he, he had nothing to do with it, that it was probably just some outside pike or some, you know, yahoos from out of town. Because if you were going to pull something like this, in Kansas City, you had to clear it with him or Tom Pendergast, and and no one had cleared it. So, so he wasn't a happy guy. He was not a happy guy. Well, Jim told him, regardless, you can find out who did it, and you can bring her back, and you will do that and within 24 him. hours. Yes. He threatened him. So Johnny Lazzi is on board, and mm -hmm. he sends out 25 cars. Fully Big black hoodlums. Buicks of hoodlums <laughs> spreading out across Kansas City to look for the bad guys. Uh, must have been oddly comforting for Kansas Cityans to know that professional criminals were handling the situation. <laughs> but Lazia's men found out, they, they, looking at, the, at this rope that was in the back of the car that they'd left behind at the Plaza Theater and the paint chips, and somebody remembered that there had been this gas station out in Wyandotte mm -hmm. County that had just been repainted red, the same mm -hmm. color as these, these paint chips. And so they interviewed the gas station owner who talked about a guy named Victor Bonura, mm -hmm. who was a restaurant owner, and it turned out he'd been hired uh, to, to uh, bring Supply some food, food yeah. to this farmhouse. And then where you he, were. he drew a map. Um, because he was afraid for his life, obviously. He drew a map to where the farmhouse was and then quickly got out of town. Elazia's men, find you. Yes. Three o'clock in the morning, they come busting through the doors of the, the farmhouse. They said, uh, not to worry, they're here to release me. And, and they, they told George to get up, and, and they had us walk out to the car with them. And I thought, oh, this, this is not good. I, this, is, this is it. I, these men were scarier than the ones that were holding me. <laughs> and I thought we were going for the ride, you know, the, the ride. Right. They took you and they, they dropped you at uh, an all-night cafe? Yeah, they took me just a little ways down the road and they, they dropped us off outside and said, start and, walking. And, they, and that's where we ended up. And Marshall Depew was the name of the guy who actually kidnapped yes. you and he had an alias. His alias was Marshall... Martin Depew. Marshall Deputy was Marshall his alias. Marshall Deputy yes. was his, his alias. Where, where did they... Ethel, Ethel his, Ethel, wife, his had wife, had been his, Paul's... Had been our nurse. Had been Paul's nurse in our house so, a aha. year before. That's where And she was from. tried, but she was acquitted. She said that it was just her, her husband's crazy idea he, he hatched when she was working for us. And so, so they caught these guys, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the bad guys, and they all go to, go to jail. Paul's not much help in his mysterious uh, illnesses. He and, was the original intended victim. Did you know that? They wanted him, but he was having one of his illnesses, he and sick. he was in the so house forever, and they got tired of waiting and picked me. And, <laughs> and, and at this point, you're running the company. You buy Paul out of the company and, and, and divorce him, I something very him. unusual in 1931, but you have an opportunity. Senator Reed's wife, who interestingly enough is much, much, much older than he is. Yes. She dies at the age years. of 88, Laura. And, and so you're free and he's free and you, there, there's, a, there's a dinner party that you, you give for 30 friends or, or so. It was about a year then later, but uh, yeah. we waited until uh, everybody had finished their, their meal before dessert came. And um, I asked everybody to stand up and bear witness as uh, federal judge, John C. Pollock, who was also a guest, married us right there on the spot. A unique, a, a unique dinner, uh, dinner party. And <laughs> Surprised everybody. <laughs> Together we bought a 7,000 acre ranch in Michigan 
and he taught me how to hunt and fish. I was very good at it too, I'll have you know. You never missed a day of hunting, uh, or an opening day of uh, the hunting season, I'm, I'm told, except for the year that the senator except died yes, yes. Uh, in, uh, in 1940, 1944. 1944. September 8th. Had, had 11 years. Uh, uh, the best 11 years of my life. Best 11 years of your life. You, you, you built this great company, and one of the ways you built the company that, that's clear from talking to the people who've worked with you over the years is you were a great boss. You were, you were <laughs> a great you. leader of, of, of that company. And, but what, what, what did you do for your employees that made, you, that made them want to get up in the morning every day? What made them want to come to work? Well, I took excellent care of them. I cared about each and every one of them. I, I did things um, as an employer uh, rather ahead of the time, actually. I, they, they all got the highest wages in the industry. Um, but more importantly, it was the, it was the little things. You know, it, work in the factory can be tedious and um, stressful because it's, it's repetitive. So I tried to make it more pleasant to come to work. I, I, replaced all the floors with hardwood floors so they wouldn't have to stand on concrete all day. And there were ceiling fans and keeping the air moving and uh, air, air conditioning, conditioning as soon invented, as, yes, absolutely, as, soon as I could get my hands on it. One of the first air conditioned a plant. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I established a pension plan and, and uh, there was a, a medical, medical site. Yes. And they got hospital benefits. And um, I would pay for any employee to go to college at night that wanted to and a scholarship fund for their children. And, and, and you were thinking in small ways that probably had big importance about the families, and, and yet the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and David Dubinsky decide to make an example out of you in the 1940s. I never liked David unions. David Dubinsky, yeah. He spent $100,000 going after you. Now, your employees, how did they, how did they react to this attempt to, to oh. unionize the company? They'd been so close to you. Yeah, there was picketers harassing them. Uh, they were spreading lies. That's what I didn't like about the man. It, it, he was spreading lies, bald-faced lies, about the company. They created, your employees created something called the Nellie Don Loyalty League. It was essentially a company, a company union started by the employees, and they had a pledge that they signed. You had 1,300 employees at that point. And all but six signed it. 1,294 of the 1,300 stuck, stuck with you. That's right. World War II comes, and of course it changes everything in American manufacturing. Mm -hmm. They come to you and ask you to, to make uniforms. Yes, they did. They, a supply colonel showed up one day, and he had these pictures of uniforms that, and asked if I could make these for their, their female personnel. And I looked at it, and I said, no. And he seemed rather taken aback and said, why not? And I said, because these will never fit any woman ever born. <laughs> But I will make you something that looks like that. Even for the army, you want fashion and fit. Absolutely. You, you, end, you end up making, making five million pairs of underwear, so it could be said you were the foundation of victory. That's right. <laughs> and all it costs, too, I'll have you know. Uh, I did not want to be known as a war profiteer, so what it cost to make is what the government paid me. You never made a nickel during, never the, made during a nickel the war. During you, did war it, you, did it, you did it at cost. That's, that's extremely patriotic. You know they patriotic. hauled me in front of a, a Senate committee? Yes, and, and what, did they, what, did they, what did they want? Well, apparently they have something called a defect ratio, and mine wasn't high enough. Yes. <laughs> when you work for the government, you're allowed a certain percentage of defective merchandise. So they thought you must have been lying to them, Well, right? they, they wanted to know the meaning of this because I had none. <laughs> no defective merchandise. And, and I said to them, I simply said, I have never allowed defective merchandise to leave my factories, and I didn't see why uniforms should be any different than a fashion garment, and I just simply wasn't going to make defective trousers, and that's all there was to it, and I burst into tears. And, and, and so ultimately, in, in, instead of indicting you for, uh, for having no defects, they gave you... They gave me a medal. They gave you a medal. <laughs> They, the E they, for Excellence Award. They, they, so, end of the war, 1947. Let's, let's look at 1947 for a second. $14 million in sales, the largest dress manufacturer in the world. Mm. And you decide to build... The largest dress manufacturing factory in the world. It was two city blocks wide. It was at uh, 3500 East 17th Street, so a few blocks east of 18th and Vine area now. It had so many innovations. Uh, you even had a railroad hub for bringing fabrics in and then shipping dresses out. It was, it was something. <laughs> it was a marvel. But you, you've reached a certain age, and so you sold the company in, in, in 1956 mm -hmm. and kind of changed the, uh, what you did in the world at that point. You mm -hmm. became something of a philanthropist. Yes. And Spent a lot of time with family 
and took part in civic activities that I cared about, that sort of thing. You really, it's important to be a well-balanced person. You can't spend all of your time focusing on business, especially things that can be taken care of by somebody else. It, it doesn't leave any time for your development as a human being. So I, I focused a lot more on that sort of thing. You were the greatest businesswoman of your time. What was the secret of your success? <laughs> I simply understood what women wanted. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, an incredible American in Kansas City success story, Nell Quinlan Donnelly Reed. We had a gem right here in our own hometown. She changed the industry and uh, innovated the way ladies' garments are made. And everybody that came after learned from her. And um, she's a remarkable woman. She was the second self-made millionaire, female millionaire in, in the country's history by the time she was 27. That was extraordinary. And before they asked me to do this, I had never heard of her. And I think that's tragic. To learn more about Nell Donnelly Reed, reading lists and more can be found at the Kansas City Public Library or at kclibrary.org.